Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General Hospital. Today's program is part of a Mass General Cancer Center series, which is a special collaboration between the Blum Center and Mass General Cancer Center. Before we get started, I just wanna go over a few items with you all. Please note that today's session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you may visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note that you are in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted so that we can hear our guest speaker today. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, you may use a chat feature, which is located the bumper screen. We'll have time for them in the end. Only Blum Center staff, our co-host and guest speaker will see your questions. Please do not share any personal medical information or questions in the chat box. If you have a personal medical question, please ask your doctor. Lastly, at the end of today's session, you'll be directed to a brief survey, which we'd like to ask you to complete. Your feedback is helpful to us as we plan future programs. So next, I am going to hand it over to Devin Punch. She is the health educator for Mass General Cancer Center, and she'll introduce you all to today's guest speaker. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for being here today. And a big thank you to Dr. Vic Vicki Jackson for speaking. Um, Dr. Jackson is the Chief of the Division of Palliative Care and Geriatric Medicine at Mass General Hospital. And she's the professor, a professor in the Department of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. She serves as the co-director of the Harvard Medical School Center for Palliative Care. Dr. Jackson is a lead investigator and mentor on numerous studies investigating the effect of early integrative palliative care for patients with advanced cancer. She's also the co-author of the book, Living with Cancer, a step-by-step -step guide to coping medically and emotionally with a, with a serious diagnosis. Thank you so much for being here today and I turn it over to you. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here today. Um, let me share my screen. Can everybody see that okay? Um, so before I start, I would just like to um, uh, give my deep gratitude to the Blum family. Um, the Blum family, um, as you know, has been really invested in patient family um, education for a long time and sponsors the Blum Center and has also um, sponsors a chair in palliative care to help um, support our work. So with deep gratitude um, to the Blum family. Um, so let's just to review what we'll be talking about today. Um, we'll be talking a bit about what's, what do we know from the literature about what's important to patients living with serious illness. We'll talk about what is palliative care, what is the evidence uh, supporting palliative care, and what, what do we think is the secret ingredient, what's in the syringe about why we see these important um, outcomes with palliative care. What are we doing at MGH to improve the patient experience for those with serious illness? And then we'll take it personally. How can you think about whether you're living with serious illness or not? Think about what's important to you. Those you may be a caregiver for somebody, for an aging parent or uh, a family member who has um, an illness or aging process that it's important to think about um, their goals and values. So we'll, we'll um, end our time together with that. So when I think about um, sort of how we as a society think about having these kinds of conversations and thinking about supporting patients and families living with serious illness, I really think there's been a cultural shift that has happened in the last 15 to 20 years. Atul Gawande has been incredibly important in, um, in helping um, promote this dialogue. His book, Being Mortal, um, was really incredibly um, eye-opening for um, lots and lots of patients and families um, thinking about how, how do we engage in thinking about what's important to us in our life. I think, you know, before the pandemic hit, we couldn't open up the New York Times or any um, um, sort of major publication and not see something about how do we think about taking charge of what's important to us when we're um, faced with a serious illness or in the last phase of our life through an aging process. You know, when we look at the literature, uh, it's really interesting and pretty clear what patients and families want. 
Um, when someone is living with serious illness, patients want to be comfortable. They want relief from pain and other symptoms. They really want to relieve any burden to their family. They also want to achieve a sense of control, often in the setting of an illness that has robbed them of control. Um, also importantly, what they want help in is strengthening relationships with loved ones. So really they are wanting uh, to feel well enough to be able to do the things that are important to them um, while they're living with their illness. Um, we also know that patients want informed, shared medical decision-making with the medical team. And we're going to talk about that a fair amount um, through our time together today, that how can patients and families actually be informed um, with what the clinical team thinks is happening and um, to be able to have goals and values that are fully informed by the medical issues at hand. Most patients will say to me, Vicki, if you think I am going to live and have a good quality of life. I want to live and I want to do everything I can to be able to, to live as long as I can. If you actually think I'm beginning to die, I'm in the last phase of my life, I don't want that dying process prolonged. So that is part of the difficult conversation that we often have in these spaces um, with patients and families as they're navigating serious illness. I want to um, sort of kick off with um, a patient video, a patient who I interviewed who was in the hospital, just to begin to think about this idea of being centered on people's goals and values and what's important to them and how that drives us as a clinical care team. So this um, man named David uh, had metastatic renal cell cancer. Uh, he was admitted to the hospital with severe pain, it required very aggressive symptom management from our team. And um, this is just a two minute clip of me talking to him about his understanding of his illness. And in light of that, what's important to him. So I'm going to stop sharing screen and I'm going to let Amy um, share screen to, sh to show this video. So it sounds like your sense from Dr. Lee is that the cancer is growing in your belly. Oh, absolutely. And, and he's pretty worried about that. Is that your sense? Yeah. Yeah. That's about it. Yeah. And so it sounds like when I hear you talk about it, David, that you have a sense that time's not unlimited, that at some point this cancer may take your life. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's your sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's gonna. Yeah. Sooner or later. Yeah. Yeah, it's growing, it grows fast. Yeah. And, and it's not afraid. The cancer's not afraid? It's not afraid. It does its thing. It, it wants to eat more of me. Yeah. And how do you, how do you make sense of that day to day? How do you live with knowing that Time shorter than what you'd hope. Well, I really can't. I can't change the fact that it's going to get me. That I can't change. It's accepted. What I can change is the amount of time I have to use it wisely and understand it that I am gonna, if I, if I have three months left, I wanna do as much as I can in that three months. Mm -hmm. And I gotta learn what it is that's left. Could, in other words, I wanna spend time with my wife, mm -hmm. make her something that shows how much I love her. Yeah, what do you wanna make her? I'll just do something out of wood, of course. Mm -hmm. I don't know yet. It'll, it'll come to me. The spirit will move you. Yeah, that's right. It'll be mm -hmm. something she can hang on the wall, maybe. You know, mm -hmm. uh, a piece of art. I don't know. <laughs> so, oh, uh, hold on. I'm just going to uh, 
uh, share my screen again. So um, in hearing David talk about what's important to him, I know that he has a sense that this cancer is very serious. I also know that what's important is for him to spend time with his family and I better get his pain under good control so he can get in that wood shop, right? Because that's what's important. We're both hoping he's gonna live as long as he can. And we know that at the end of the day, this cancer is probably going to be the thing that takes his life. What I know in doing this work for 20 years with patients and families is that it is not uncommon that patients have all these thoughts and concerns and they're too afraid to share it with anyone. They're incredibly isolated because they don't want to make anybody sad. They don't want to um, think about talking about all these things. And yet it's incredibly difficult and stressful. So part of my job and part of what I love about my job is whether I'm working with a patient who is going to live 10 years with their cancer or 10 months, my job is to help them live well, live fully, and live that life in the way that um, is meaningful for them, which is what I love about my job. That When we can do that, we've succeeded. When we failed as a medical community is when this happens. So this was a patient who a colleague of mine saw when she was um, working at UCSF. It was a person who had um, widely metastatic cancer, had never had a discussion about what was important, got intubated, was um, meant that that person was on a breathing machine in the intensive care unit and, she, and lost his voice. He could not speak because he had the tube in his throat. And she sat down and she said, I want to understand what's important to you. And he grabbed the piece of paper from her and, and uh, scratched this on the piece of paper. As a medical community, if we have not asked what's important to someone so they can live their life fully and make their, um, do what they wanna do for their family, and it's at the very end of their life that they're telling us what's important, then we have failed. Then we have definitely failed. So. Um, when we think about what palliative care is, it's really helping patients, as I said, and families live as fully as they can. So this is the definition of palliative care. It's medical care for patients with serious illness and their families. It's appropriate at any age for any diagnosis at any stage in a serious illness and can be uh, provided at the same time patients are receiving disease modifying or curative treatments. We do studies and see patients who are getting bone marrow transplant for their leukemia and they are cured. But let me tell you, going through that diagnosis and that treatment is hard. And so we're focusing on their symptoms, focused on improving quality of life. And also the last point here is really something that's important is we work as part of an interdisciplinary team. So I work with other doctors, nurses, social workers, chaplains to really provide a holistic approach. And we integrate with the primary oncology team or heart failure team to be another layer of support and space to talk about all of these important um, pieces of living with a serious illness. So what is palliative care and what is it not? So I always think about it, it's excellent evidence-based medical treatment, it's vigorous care of pain and symptoms throughout the illness, care that can be provided at the same time we're um, working toward cure or life prolongation. W one thing that's key is it is not giving up on the patient and it is not in place of curative or life prolonging treatment and it's not the same as hospice. So let's talk a little bit about how um, palliative care um, differs from hospice, because this is a common confusion for many um, patients, families, and clinicians, truthfully. So hospice is a medical insurance benefit that provides care for patients in the last weeks and months of life. So patients have to have two physicians certify that if the illness takes its usual course, that it would be that that patient would have a prognosis of less than six months. Typically, patients must give up insurance coverage for curative or life prolonging care. I would say for patients who are in the very last phase of their life, hospice is the gold standard of care. It is excellent. It is provided often, most typically in the home, and can be very, very helpful to patients and families. 
<clears throat> palliative care is different in that we can be seeing patients with any illness at any stage. There is no need to give up any um, active treatment, life prolonging treatment or curative treatment. Our goal is to just help patients and families with serious illness navigate the illness and live as well as they can. And anybody can ask, um, we got a question ahead of time, which is who can ask for a palliative care consult and any patient or family can ask. You can ask your clinician or you can actually just call our outpatient office and ask for a, uh, ask for a consult. And we are happy to, happy to see you. So let's talk a little bit about the evidence um, for palliative care. Much of a, a really important part of the evidence was done here at Mass General. So we've, um, I've been collaborating with Jennifer Temmel, who's a thoracic oncologist here, um, doing this research um, with our research team for the last 20 years, 15 to 20 years now. It has been a long time. So the first study that really um, got a lot of press was a study we did for patients who had metastatic lung cancer. And the study um, randomized patients to either get standard oncology care and then palliative care whenever the oncologist thought about it versus palliative care um, joining with the oncologist at the time of diagnosis for patients and then following them throughout the course of their illness. We looked primarily at the patient's quality of life and also looked at mood, healthcare utilization, and how well they understood their illness. And what we found was that patients receiving early palliative care had an improved quality of life, which thank goodness, right? Because I'm a quality of life doctor, that would have been super embarrassing, but improved quality of life, which was good. The other um, outcome that we found that was really important, probably most important to me, was that patients who saw palliative care early had a significantly lower rate of depression. And that was important to me for a couple of reasons. Sometimes, not so much now, but years ago, people would say, oh, that's silly. They don't need palliative care that's just going to make them depressed and they're gonna give up. The data has not borne that out at all. If anything, the mental health outcomes are better when we're involved because we're helping patients live well. I remember in our first study, I had a patient who said to me, so Vicki, let me get this straight. You're gonna help me feel as well as I can and I'm just gonna live my life. And then if you get worried that I might like, time might be short, you'll tell me. I was like, that sounds great. That sounds like a plan. He's like, well, then I'm just going to go have fun. And I was like, okay, excellent. So there's a way in which um, I think empowering patients and having another space to talk about the concerns that come up are really helpful and promote these better mental health outcomes. The other thing we note, noted from our study was that when patients saw palliative care early, they were more likely to have an accurate understanding of their illness and what to expect over time, which as we'll talk about in a few minutes is really important because if people have a sense that they're going to live 10 years, they make very different decisions than if they think they're going to live 10 months. And so really having patients have an accurate understanding of their illness is really important. The other things we saw were that patients who saw palliative care early had higher quality end of life outcomes when, they, when it was their time from the illness and they um, were able to have more time at home um, receiving hospice care and being with their family. We also um, interestingly found that patients who saw palliative care were less likely to get IV chemotherapy in the last two months of their life. And the reason this, that was very interesting to me is that the reason this study got a lot of press was that patients who saw palliative care early live nearly three months longer than patients who didn't, which is pretty powerful, right? Now, why did we look at survival? Did we think that palliative care was going to provide a survival benefit? Absolutely not. We looked at it because we wanted to be able to respond to criticism where people may say, sure, you made them feel better and they were less depressed, but they, they, um, they died sooner. And that was definitely not the case. That was not what we, um, what we saw. So, um, and despite patients not getting IV chemotherapy close to the end of their life. And so part of that, I think, is there are times when we give chemotherapy to patients when actually 
um, they are so sick from their cancer that it may make time shorter and not longer. So it's been very interesting in terms of thinking about how can we help support and have patients live better and maybe longer by attending to all of these, all of these issues that are in within the palliative care domain. So what's in the palliative care syringe? Why does this actually, why do we think this works? And we've done lots of um, additional studies looking at our data to try to understand that. One piece that we know is really important is this sort of illness understanding prognostic awareness that I spoke about earlier. And we really define that as patients having an understanding of their likely disease trajectory. And why is that important? They can weigh burdens and benefits of treatment. They can have more meaningful discussions with their families about and their clinicians about their goals and values. And they can match treatment decisions to those goals and values. You know, what we see is that patients often early on in the illness are more likely to be incredibly hopeful. And that's really normative, right? So I'll have patients say, I know that the oncologist told me that I have a 5% five-year survival, but I'm healthy. I've been lucky. Why not me? Which that's completely adaptive. And we would all love to see each of every one of those patients be in that 5%. As patients live with the illness, I find them beginning to express an understanding that there's uncertainty, right? So they may say to me, you know what? I'm thinking we should take the kids on that trip to Europe this summer instead of next summer. And I'm like, that sounds good. You're feeling good. Let's do that this summer. They're beginning to understand that we don't know what the future will hold. And that changes the decisions they make about how they live with their life. They live their life. So when we think about what palliative care does that helps in this process, I really think this bottom graph, uh, the bottom bar in the schematic are really an important piece about what I do. So um, I am really aggressively treating somebody's physical symptoms. So what I know is that patients who have terrible shortness of breath or terrible cancer pain or terrible depression actually can't be engaged and often can't get the same treatment um, for their cancer if um, those symptoms aren't in good control. So part of what I'm doing is trying to make sure that those symptoms are as well controlled as possible. I'm also trying to help them cope as effectively as possible. So that means thinking about ways to contain all of the difficult emotions that come up, being able to think about ways that they can um, live fully, be engaged with the work that they want to do, whether that's with their family or in their professional realm, helping them be as active as possible. And with when those two, um, when that foundation is there, patients and families can do this higher order work. They can integrate the likely illness trajectory. They can think if we are in that space, as David said, if I've got three months, get me out in the wood shop so I can make something for my wife to hang on the wall. And it helps then with medical decision-making. Is that phase one clinical trial something that would help me? Or is that really not what I want right now? So that helps um, all of the clinicians caring for that patient and family to be able to um, make good medical decisions. So, you know, to think about this a little more, as we think about patients understanding their illness and how that impacts their goals and values, it impacts the medical decision-making that they do. Um, and part of the way we do that is in well times, helping patients acknowledge both realities. That, you know, we're gonna live as fully as possible and this is a serious illness. And we hope that this is an illness that, that doesn't, um, impact your life and life expectancy for a long time. And there's a chance it might. And if that is true, how do we hold both realities as possible? And how do we actually, we think about it as this dual framework to be able to hold both realities. And with that, when they can be, those two realities can be held together, it changes people's goals and values. So there was a patient I cared for many years ago who was, uh, you know, a middle-aged man with young kids who had um, was in the business world and was kind of used to just having things go his way. And he had an aggressive cancer. 
And he just could not believe, although the doctors had told him that this was something that at some point would take his life. And he would, he was going all over the country. He was getting very aggressive treatment with us, but going all over the country, getting um, second opinions, just kind of hoping that he would get a different answer. And one day he said to me, Vicki, can I ask you something? And I said, sure. And he said, do you really, really think I could die from this? Are you serious that you think I could die from this? And I said, you know, I wish I had different news. What we know right now about this kind of cancer, we don't have a way to cure it. We don't have a way to take it away. Now, I hope you get to live for a long time with it. And what I know right now, I do think that this is going to be the thing that's going to take your life at some point. And he said to me, well, then why on God's green earth are you letting me go all over the country? I should be at home hanging out with my kids. And I thought, oh, with a deeper understanding about the likely illness trajectory, he made different decisions for his family. He still got incredibly aggressive treatment with us, incredibly aggressive, but he wasn't going to um, go all over the country looking for a different answer. He was going to stay here and get the aggressive treatment that he wanted to, to make sure he had done everything possible to live as long as he could for his family. So what are we doing to improve the patient care, the patient experience for those with serious illness? So, you know, one thing I should say before I talk about this a little bit is, you know, we're embedded in the cancer center. We see patients five days a week. We have three um, clinicians seeing patients every day in the cancer center and are very available for our um, clinicians in the cancer center to be able to see patients. We also see patients on the inpatient side, and we also have a home-based palliative care program too. So we have, we're very fortunate to have one of the largest palliative care programs in the country to be able to um, support the care of patients and families. And we also know that there aren't going to be enough of us. So part of what we've been thinking is how do we help patients and families and clinicians um, be able to make sure that they're supporting these kinds of conversations over time. So one thing that is um, really important to understand is that um, the illness trajectory for most patients with serious illness is uncertain, right? So in cancer, um, often, this is less true now, um, it was clearer that patients would live a certain amount of time and then the disease, the cancer drugs would stop working. In truth, cancer has now come to look more like the red line. It's up and down. Sometimes people will plateau with some of the new cancer treatments we have for years, which never would have, we never would have imagined was possible before. I always say to my patients, we're in this golden age of oncology treatment where patients may live for years um, where that was not possible before. But even with that, even when things are going well, there is uncertainty and that is hard for patients and families. And what we know from the literature is that patients and families want to have conversations about their illness, but we know that it's uncommon, infrequent, fewer than a third of patients with um, advanced diagnoses report having discussions with their clinicians. And if they do, they're often very, very late and limited and limited qualities of discussion. And what we know from a variety of different surveys is that wishes often go unexpressed. 80% of patients report wanting to talk to their families and doctors about what to expect with the illness and planning for the future. Only 20% report having had these conversations with their families and only 10% report having had these conversations with their doctors. So I think about living with a serious illness for a patient often is an incredibly isolating experience, which is part of what we've been trying to do to help encourage these kinds of conversations. So there are lots of different ways to think about things that patients and families can do to begin to plan for their future medical care. And one way that we think about this is this concept of advanced care planning, um, thinking about ways to think about your wishes and document them um, for your clinical team to understand and have discussions with your clinical team. Some of you may have heard about something called a living will. Um, that is completed with an attorney 
One thing that's really important to know is that a living will is a legal document. It's not a medical document. So it doesn't actually translate into your medical care unless you've had a conversation with your clinician and orders are put into your medical record. Uh, the five wishes form is a form that is completed independently by patients and families, and it asks a variety of questions to help um, patients and families begin to think about um, these issues. Two important documents are thinking about ways that you can assign someone to have um, the legal authority to um, make medical decisions for you or uh, you know, you might be asked to be the healthcare proxy for a loved one in the event that that person cannot speak on their own behalf. In Massachusetts, it's called a healthcare proxy form. You can download that from a, um, just a website, a state website, or a durable power, power of attorney for healthcare. And other states um, use a durable power of attorney for healthcare. And it's really important to assign somebody as the uh, healthcare proxy, my daughter is 19, and um, now that she's an adult, uh, she needs to actually assign me and her, me and my husband to be her healthcare proxy because if she got into a car accident, God forbid, um, we would have to be able to have the authority to speak on her behalf. So this is important whether you have a serious illness or not. And the other thing that's really important is that you have had a conversation with that person about what's important to you and how you think about how you think about your care. So one thing that we've been working on here, um, which was part of when Peter Slavin was here, um, a uh, really broad based approach to make sure that every clinician in the institution would have the skills to help engage patients and families in this discussion um, is a project called the Continuum Project. And the goal of the Continuum Project is really to build a culture of living well in the face of serious illness and how clinicians can help support that, um, those discussions and that care. And this is a website um, that I invite you to uh, view that has um, materials both for clinicians and for patients and families um, thinking about having these conversations. So what we've done here is institute a serious illness care program, which provides a system-based approach to having goals and values conversations. Uh, so we develop tools for clinicians and preparatory um, materials for patients and families, educational sessions to train clinicians to have these conversations, and then support for there to be these conversations on the inpatient side, on the outpatient side, and Really, these um, this guide. This was old branding um, before we have we just getting it rebranded to MGB. Um, a guide to ask these questions to help support patients and families. What is your understanding of your illness? Re looking to the future, what are your hopes about your health? And also, what are your worries? And that these are really important questions to begin this conversation. A nurse can begin this conversation, a social worker, a chaplain, a physician, um, anybody in the institution. So since 2017, we've trained about 1,800 clinicians um, in the institution, and, and there have been uh, almost 20,000 documented conversations, um, which is really important because th these conversations being documented, if a patient has that conversation with a nurse in the infusion center at, at, in the cancer center, and that patient gets admitted to the emergency department, they will have the beginnings of that conversation to build off of. I sort of think about it like a relay race. We're handing the baton um, from one um, provider to the other to understand um, what's important to this patient. So for our final bit of our time together, I'd like us to begin to think um, more personally about our goals and values and what's important to us, whether we're living with a serious illness or not, because I'd say one of the things that I find most um, rewarding about doing the work that I do is it makes me remember like I should not take things for granted. Like I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow because it is just dumb luck that it's not me in that bed. Um, we all live with this uncertainty. So it's important for all of us to think about what's important. So one thing that I'd love you to just think a little bit about 
If you've observed friends or family navigating illness and planning for the future, I'd love for you to think from your perspective, what did you observe there? What went well? What didn't go so well? What do you wish um, would have gone differently? To begin to think about understanding your goals and values and what's important to you. Um, an uh, uh, organization that is really helpful in helping families have these conversations and think about them very, very upstream is an organization called the Conversation Project. It was started by Ellen Goodman, who is um, a former uh, Boston Globe uh, reporter, award-winning reporter, who came to this work because she realized when she was caring for her mother, who was aging, she had no idea what was important to her mother. And she started to build um, uh, processes and materials to help families um, begin to have these discussions. And um, I'm gonna uh, ask Amy to show this video, which I'll just set this up, which is a um, video of uh, a patient and family who are engaging in, a, in this conversation. And they are, um, ABC World News Tonight is uh, sort of highlighting this work with the conversation project. And you'll hear, hear Ellen speak, Atul Gawande speak, and then hear this really wonderful loving family um, with an aging parent begin this conversation. So Amy, I'll, great, thank you. Tonight, ABC News wants to join you in something right at the heart of the American family. How we can all help the people who care about us make decisions near the end of our lives. And nine out of ten of you have told us that we should all be talking about it at all ages, what we want. And yet only a fraction of us have done it. And we know it makes a huge difference in the health of the caregiver as well as those cared for. So ABC News has taken cameras inside a vital, loving family, part of a new community, deciding to have the conversation. This is 85-year-old Norb and his daughter, Maureen. My dad is 85 today. He's still very, very active. He's a wonderful friend. Throughout life, daughter and father have always talked about everything, except one thing how to control the end of your life in the same way you control the prime of your life. So dad and daughter gather the family together, three generations, for an act of love. And so now we're just asking that you share some of your thoughts about what you would like at the end of your life um, so that we can honor your wishes. They are part of something new underway for families in America that says having the conversation is a gift parents and children give each other. And there's proof of the difference it makes. Studies show depression rates plummet after a loss if the families have had the conversation. Renowned physician Dr. Atul Gawande says doctors and nurses see it firsthand. When you're there in that moment and you're talking to the family and you're saying, how much will it bother your father if he ends up this way? And they say, more often than not, I don't know. We never talked about it. That that it is incredibly traumatic for the family, for the doctors involved. There's often conflict. Um, it can tear families apart. So Dr. Gwande has become part of a team led by Pulitzer Prize winning writer Ellen Goodman. It is called The Conversation Project. It is a kind of guide for families looking for a way to begin. If we give them a way to talk about it and give people something to hang on to when they're afraid to start this conversation, they can do it and pass it on. Families like the Jennings. They looked over the conversation guide before they sat down together. First, there's laughter. Oh, my golf swing's still good. <laughs> <laughs> and then dad directly eases his daughter's guilt and worry about having put their mother in hospice. I felt like that meant we were giving up on mom. She was in a lot of pain, and I think, uh, I think it was handled real well. And next, Maureen asks her dad for clarity on what he considers a good end to a great okay, life. So if you were in a condition where you couldn't make decisions for yourself, how, how extreme would you want us to take measures to save your life versus letting you go? Well, I, I, I think I'm ready to go anytime. You know, I, I wouldn't prolong anything. 
I mean, uh, I, I've lived a great life. Pretty lucky. Pretty lucky. And because of you guys, you know. And Unexpectedly, a grandson is inspired to speak up about his own wishes for his own life. That if there was no meaningful communication, that that I would want, I would want you to to, to stop trying to intervene. We aren't ready for you to go that soon. <laughs> well, we're not ready for you to go that soon either. So, <laughs> one by one, the others weigh in, all ages. Don't do that. Happy birthday, And with that. Another family has joined a kind of estate planning for the heart. Go. The conversation beginning in America. Okay, Amy, thank you. Please tell us your stories and the days of... Thank you. Um, I have to say I've seen that um, multiple times and I still, uh, it gets me a little each time I tear up when I see the um, uh, father talk about his um, experiences. Okay, let me, hmm, let me try to just share my screen here and um, we can finish up. Um, so, you know, I think one thing just to go back that's really beautiful about that is it's really common that families, everybody harbors worries and concerns about did they handle some of these things right? And as hard as these conversations are, it is such a gift to be able to have this dialogue. You give the gift to your family when you tell them what's important to you and how to guide them in the care that they would provide. And it's hard. I remember when my mom was aging and my sister's a nurse and we asked her what's important. And she said, I can't believe you're asking me these things, right? It took many tries at this conversation, despite um, my sister and I being pretty skilled in this to have her feel comfortable to talk about these difficult, these difficult kinds of, of things. But it is really a gift. It helps families um, feel good that they're doing right by their loved ones, um, which is important. So another um, piece that I think is important is as you're making a decision for choosing who would be best to be the kind of person to be a medical decision maker, there's a really great um, organization called Prepare for Your Care, um, which helps take you through how do you decide who would be a good medical decision maker for you? You know, it has to be somebody who's over 18. Are they able to talk with you about your wishes? Are um, they comfortable talking with your medical team about your illness? Are they comfortable being your voice? And are they comfortable being the family spokesperson who's responsible for these decisions? I guess one thing I would say is some for some um, families, it's clearly the spouse that is the right person to be in this role. And I've certainly had patients say, I cannot ask my spouse to do this. It would be too difficult. And I'm going to ask my um, dear friend or my child or my sibling. So there aren't right or wrong answers. People choose different people to serve in this role, but it's important to choose someone and to have a discussion with them. And also to think about what feels important to talk about. Do you have any particular concerns about your health? Um, what, are there affairs that you feel like you need to get in order or want to talk with someone about? Is there someone you do or do not want to be involved in your care? Is there care you would or would not want to receive? Um, we had a very dear friend of ours who uh, had died from a brain tumor and I like very, very close with him and his family and he hated fruit. And he said, Vicki, do not let people feed me fruit. If I can't talk for myself, please make sure that that is true. These kinds of things that kind, kind of can seem um, funny or silly, but are really important um, when somebody is feeling vulnerable and they can't speak for themselves. Are there treatments you would not or not would want or not want? Breathing machine, feeding tubes. One thing that I often say about making those kinds of medical decisions, it's really important to ask your clinicians do you think a breathing machine or a feeding tube would be helpful to me? Because you want that input as you're making those kinds of decisions. Um, and when is it okay or not okay to shift a focus from cure to a focus on comfort alone? I've had patients who say, my 
spiritual tradition and belief is that every second of life is critically important. And I don't care about quality. I care about quantity. We're going to recommend very different decisions for a patient who has those goals and values than someone who is really prioritizing quality over quantity. So those are the kinds of things that are important to talk about. So things that I'd love for you to begin to think about, to advocate for yourself and your loved ones, make sure that you've got a healthcare proxy and those around you do, do as well. And to really do some of this personal work. What does quality of life look like to you? And share that with the people who are important in your life. Um, this is a patient of mine who I took care of for several years who had metastatic cancer. And, you know, one of the things we worked on being able to be in her body and be active was one of the most important things for her. And so just one thing that I hope you'll take away from this talk is that palliative care is about helping patients and families meet those goals and to be able to be as active as possible and um, to be able to live in the way they want to um, for as long as they can. So. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to um, think through some questions together. Thank you so much for this presentation. It's wonderful information. It's hopefully helpful to so many people and very valuable to hear about a lot of the resources and the, the project. Um, we do have some time now for questions and there were a couple that were submitted previously. Um, and some of these you may have touched upon in your talk already, but I'll still ask just in case anyone missed or if there's anything um, that's kind of you think might be worth you know digging into a little bit more or other thoughts come up. Um, who decides when someone needs palliative care? Is it the doctor, the family, a combination of both? What do you usually experience? I think it just really depends. I think um, patients or families may recommend it. Um, we suggest having them talk to their physician about it um, or a nurse practitioner. The nurse practitioner or physician may recommend it. Um, and patients can come separate of their clinician providing, uh, putting in a referral as well. And I've always assumed that palliative care is for uh, people who are not quite sick enough and ready for hospice. Is that correct? So um, patients who we, we do follow patients into hospice, but we tend to see them um, much further upstream. So we sent, tend to see them months or years before hospice would be necessary. Can someone who is sick at home receive palliative care? Um, and if so, how is the care initiated? Yes, so um, we MGB um, does um, have a home-based palliative care program that is available. Um, it's um, roughly within the 128 area. Um, it requires that someone has a, a primary care physician that's within the MGB system, but definitely that is available. Many hospice programs also have um, home-based palliative care programs. So in case somebody lives outside that catchment area, um, that that is also um, possible. Thank you. Um, are there criteria or guidelines for determining when someone is ready or needs palliative care? And if so, what are they? And um, are they published or available anywhere? So, you know, I think if um, symptoms are not in good control, that is certainly a place um, that is uh, an obvious um, time for referral. I think if um, a patient is really struggling with how fast the disease is moving, often that can be an opportunity. Also, if um, struggling with medical decision-making related to, do I try this clinical trial? Do I not? How do I think about this next treatment? Um, all of those things are really appropriate indicators. And also um, sometimes just coping with the illness itself, um, we can be sort of an extra layer of support along with the primary, with the primary team. And you mentioned um, clinical trials. If someone has um a relative who was not qualified for a clinical trial, um, how do you sort of help or, or coach them or their, their changes to their care as a result of not qualifying? 
Yeah, I mean, it can be very difficult. The um, criteria can be very stringent for some of these um, trials. So part of what we do in that situation is help work with the patient family and the clinical team. Are there other clinical trials or clinical treatments that are available? And if not, really helping the patient be able to, even without disease modifying therapy for the cancer, be able to live as well as they can and feel as well. So that doesn't mean we stop any other medical treatment. It may be just that the cancer directed treatment is not something that is safe anymore, but we can still use medications to help with shortness of breath or nausea or pain, other kinds of, other kinds of um, symptoms to help patients do as well as they can. Thank you. Um, would it be helpful to assign palliative care with any diagnosis that's severe enough to benefit from it? So it's a great question. Um, I would say at um, I would say there are two different ways to think about that. One is I think making sure that every primary care doctor and heart failure doctor and pulmonologist who is caring for patients with serious illness has these skills. So there are not enough palliative care people to go around to see everybody. And um, we know that we need to make sure that each of those clinicians has got the skills they need to deliver the care. So that's part of what our goal is for the continuum project is to be able to, um, to, be able to do that. Thank you. Um, and uh, do you accept patients with Alzheimer's disease? We do, we do. We're actually doing a study right now of um, palliative care for patients with advanced Alzheimer's who get admitted to the um, inpatient um, uh, service at MGH. We also have got a program for patients and family caregivers living with dementia. Um, it's called our Dementia Care Collaborative. That's actually through the um, through our geriatrics section. And all of those clinicians are really well-versed in both geriatric and palliative care support for patients and families um, living with Alzheimer's. Thank you. Um, so a question about one's own experience um, at the cancer center and palliative care was mentioned a little bit kind of further down the line and there wasn't a lot of encouragement um, to get palliative care. So the yeah. question is, what is the process for making patients feel normal for getting help in the journey, um, even if the intake process wasn't quite recommended or didn't seem required for them? Yeah, so it's a great, it's a great question. I would say not all clinicians um, completely understand palliative care and how it can be of support. The other thing that we find is for patients and families who appear to be doing well, sometimes our oncology colleagues will say, you don't need it, you're doing fine, um, because they think that they're coping well and they don't have difficult symptoms and they know that, that we're quite busy. Um, I think knowing that um, families, patients and families can reach out themselves, they don't need to wait until they get a referral from a clinician. Um, and uh, you know, we will always be able to sort of think through what are things that we could do to help and be in contact with the oncologist to manage that care. I don't think we want patients or families to ever worry that someone would think, um, would feel uncomfortable with that, that the oncologist would feel comfortable with that. I see there's a second question there, Devin, which is about sort of the name palliative care. Um, which it's a really interesting thing that people will sometimes worry, does it have a negative connotation and have we ever considered a different name? So this comes up not infrequently. And the thing that I, um, I think I have noticed over the years is that as clinicians become more comfortable, they don't hear it as anything other than trying to give their patient the best shot at the best outcome and to feel as well as they can. So some of that is how comfortable the clinician is with it. The other piece is I don't really, it doesn't matter to me what feels most comfortable for us to be called. Sometimes it's called supportive care in some cancer centers. Um, other, it's, you know, other it named other things in different places. 
I think the worry I have about changing our name is that the reality is that a large proportion of the patients I care for die over the course of my care for them. That might be months, it could be years. And so my worry is that if we change our name, the negative connotation may be just with that name as well, because really what people are worried about is um, thinking about serious illness and the ability to talk about serious illness and, and death. Um, so, you know, we are, uh, so that's sort of how we think about it, I guess I would say. Um, and, and trying to make sure that people understand what we actually do um, and that it's not hospice. We're really trying to help people live as well as they can. And I have to say more and more, I am having some of my patients graduate from my palliative care clinic, which I love. I love to say, you don't need me anymore. You're doing fine. And I think the more that happens, the more um, that changes that connotation about palliative care. Thank you for that answer. Um, we have a couple minutes left and there are a few more questions that have come in. Um, can you recommend any books related to this topic? Um, so there are um, a variety of different books. Uh, Dave Ryan, who's the division chief for uh, oncology and I wrote a book, which um, Devin, you mentioned, which I'm happy to send a link out to. Um, it's, um, you know, living with, Living with Cancer, sort of a step-by-step -step guide that goes over all of these kinds of um, issues. A colleague of mine, BJ Miller, um, wrote sort of a handbook about um, really more about very end of life care and thinking about very practical kind of planning um, that can be helpful um, for, some, for some patients. Um, so those would be two resources I would think about. Thank you. Um, and two more questions here. Um, for some cultures, it isn't easy to have end of life conversations because it's thought to bring up bad luck. Do you have any experiences or solutions to overcome cultural barriers around these conversations? So I think that is a really important question. Part of what we tend to do in these settings is to say to the patient, what information would you like to know? What would be helpful? What conversation would be helpful to you? And there are certainly um, some patients who say, I don't want to have any of these discussions. I want you to talk to my son and my, I completely trust my son will be able to make the appropriate decisions for me. And that's fine. That's fine. The patient gets to decide. Um, I think when it is possible and it's culturally possible, it is helpful to the son to have an understanding of what that um, parent's wishes are, but that's not always possible. And we need to do this in a culturally appropriate way. Thank you. And our last question, who is responsible for the costs incurred for long-term palliative care for a patient? Is the family expected to assume the financial burden? or um, is there any financial assistance that's available? So that's a great question. So palliative care is covered by um, insurance, both commercial insurance and Medicare, just like any other subspecialty, just like if a patient sees radiation oncology or sees rheumatology or infectious disease, we are covered by the same insurance benefit. So there shouldn't be a cost other than a copay that would be um, uh, pos that would be necessary for any other medical um, medical appointment. Great. Thank you so much, um, Vicki. Thank you so much for being here and Amy for hosting and everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we've run out of time now, but um, the recording will be posted to the Blum website. Um, Amy, could you remind me what that link is again? I'm sorry. Sure, I entered that in the chat, but anyone interested, you can visit the Blum Center website. It's massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Great. Thank great. you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.